Uh, so welcome, friends, to our April Walla Walla Speaks. I'm Lee Gibbons. I'm the Associate Minister here at Pioneer United Methodist. Um, I'm here with Walla Walla Neighborhood Community Engagement Coordinator Zidane Gallant Laporte, and we are so happy to be joined today by Wendy Chang. Wendy spent many, many years in immigration law and now works with veterans on behalf of Walla Walla County. Tonight, she's going to reach back into her training as an immigration lawyer to talk about the history of Chinese immigration to the United States. That is its own fascinating history. But the hope tonight is that this knowledge will give us all a better uh, historical and legal framework to help us understand the pernicious, deeply rooted racism against Chinese Americans and Asian Americans more generally. Some of this history is shared, but also Asians are all often treated as a monolith, which of course they aren't. And you know that um, anti-Asian sentiment and violence are critical issues in our nation right now. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been almost 4,000 reported incidents of anti-Asian hate, uh, even while hate crimes as a whole have decreased in the last couple of years. Cities especially are seeing a slew of attacks, both verbal and physical on Asians and Asian Americans often against the elderly. And last month on March 16th, our nation mourned when a young white man killed eight people in Atlanta, including six Asian women. That murderous act highlighted the intersection of racism, misogyny, and classism, a deadly trio that you'll hear more about in Wendy's presentation tonight. So uh, one last note before we get started. We're gonna do things a little bit differently this time around. I've made the Q&A feature live this time. Um, rather than waiting till the end to ask questions, you're welcome to submit them at any time and we'll take little pauses along the way to talk about them. So that's all from me. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Wendy. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, well, that was a great introduction, Lee. Um, so I just want to start with a little bit of the origin of US immigration policy in chronological order. And then I'll go into details, the long history of discriminatory immigration policy against Chinese immigrants. Um, so when generations ago, families arrived in the United States, there were no numerical limitations, no requirement that you have an ex existing family members or job offer from a US employer. You know, unauthorized immigration was pretty much the norm until the 19th century. So then it all started with the Naturalization Act of 1790. It restricted citizenship to, quote, white, free white persons, unquote, of, quote, good moral character, unquote. So this law would have the effect of pretty much dividing the country between white and racial minority populations. And they would be limited in their citizenship, voting, residency, jury, property, and family rights. So Asian Americans, specifically Chinese Americans, would be directly affected by this piece of legislation. And it wasn't until 1952 that this was rescinded. So in the 18th and early 19th century, free and open immigration prevailed. And there was very little federal regulations of immigration policy. Um, so therefore there were no laws to break. Immigrants would just arrive at ports of entry and they would be inspected and then they would be allowed to enter the country. It wasn't until 1882 that a federal immigration bureaucracy was created and Congress passed the Immigration Act of 1891, giving the federal government the responsibility to enforce immigration laws. So Alice Island opened in 1892 as the first immigration station. And only 1% of the 25 million immigrants from Europe who arrived at Ellis Island between 1880 and World War I was excluded. Prior to 1920s, there were no numerical limitations on immigration to the US, but certain persons were banned from entering the country, um, the polygamist, the convicts, and the sick. The quota law of 1921 and the Immigration Act of 1924 created the quota system. It was based on race and nationality. These laws favored Western European immigrants. 
And then the 1929 Registry Act allowed, quote, honest law-abiding aliens who may be in the country under some merely technical irregularity, unquote, to register as permanent residents for merely $20 if they could prove that they had lived in the country since 1921 and were of good moral character. So as a result of this act, 200,000 unauthorized European legalized their status between 1925 and 1965. So it is against this backdrop that I like to go into details, the absolutely restrictive and discriminatory immigration policy that our federal government had against Chinese immigrants for six decades of 19, I'm sorry, from 1882 to 1943. So the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 stood out as the first and only major piece of federal legislation to explicitly exclude an entire ethnic group. And it was not repealed until 1943. Are there any questions out there, Leaf, since I can't see the chat room? Um, not yet. Well, I did get one. I got one from my husband who was curious about which polygamists pr precisely were being excluded. But that actually ties into an, something that came up in the Page Act, which we'll get to a little bit later. But this whole idea of uh, sexual morality and as, as kind of a, a piece of immigration is really interesting. Maybe we can circle back to that later. Because originally women from East Asia were banned often being seen as prostitutes, concubines, anyway, bringing sexual immorality to the Wild West as if that didn't exist there already. And then, but that ties in with polygamy too, right? So it's not, doesn't fit in with the sexual mores of the United States, or at least the, what they claim are the sexual mores of the United States. And I, anyway, so let's circle back to that at some point, if you find a space. Okay. Uh, and let's see, there, oh, there is one Q&A. There's one question. Oh. When were family members of Chinese men allowed? So interesting. Way yeah, so later than you I think. Get into that it's coming up. <laughs> so, and then um, let's go to how and why and when Chinese um, came to the United States. So they came here for work and for the gold rush. So by 1851, 25,000 Chinese immigrants left their homes and they're mostly from the province of Guangdong, which is the southern part of China. They moved to California to find gold. So Chinese immigrants called California Gamsan, which in Cantonese means gold mountain. So once they arrived, of course, it, it was all an illusion. I mean, mining was absolutely dangerous work and it was uncertain. So, and then they were cut off from their families and they had no money. They couldn't pay for their wives and children to come and they couldn't go back home themselves. So the vast majority of this first group of immigrants uh, from the 1840s and 1850s, they were young men. And many of them didn't have any formal education or work experience, and they, but they had to find work that required very little English. So therefore working on the railroads was ideal for them. Even though the work was difficult, the pay was low, many people were injured and killed at a very high rate. These Chinese laborers, they were very willing to accept lower wages because it was a chance, chance for them to enter the workforce. So on the Central Pacific Railroad alone, more than 10,000 Chinese workers blasted tunnels and laid hundreds of miles of track. In 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed after record-breaking five years of construction but an unknown hundreds of Chinese lost their lives. Many Chinese immigrants faced language barriers and racial discrimination. So they created businesses for themselves in the mining towns. They set up shops, restaurants, laundries. They also played quite an important role in develop developing much of the Western um, US farmland, but they suffered worse treatment than any other group that came voluntarily to the United States. They suffered racial attacks, um, persecution and murder, forced out of business, run out of town, beaten and tortured. And many times the perpetrators went unpunished because there was very little help from law enforcement. 
And then Chinese immigrants were also prohibited from working for the federal, state, and local governments. And they were also prohibited from educating their children in public schools. For several decades, a law was in place that prevented Chinese immigrants from tes testifying in court against Americans of European descent. So as a result of these anti-Chinese sentiments in the 1800s, Chinese immigrants were forced to build self-reliant communities. They were called Chinatowns and they still exist. They served as a safe haven for them, a place to shop for food and a place to do business. Any questions? I have questions. So tell me a little, what, what's the Guangdong province like and why were so many people, do you know why so many people were coming from that province in Southeast China? Um, it's, uh, it's an area where they kind of like seafaring people, they like to like travel like out. So you know, port. Fishing, port. And so naturally yeah. they have the tendency to like explore and, and go out to other areas. And that's um, where actually I think my ancestors, ancestors came from because I was born in Hong Kong and um, Cantonese is the main dialect there. So, so I also speak Cantonese. Oh, cool. Okay, so it's like, it's the traveler's province, right? So it's easy to get into these big trans-Pacific um, like pathways across. So, and yeah, so get over to San Francisco. Yeah, so they're probably like cargo ships, and you know, it would like, you know, that go come that came to the US, you know, back then. And, you know, they just need to hop on one of those ships and get shipped over here. And even though that was like a huge distance to travel, they start a lot of these fellas started out as just they were migrant workers, right? They weren't mm -hmm. planning to like put down roots here forever. They were coming to be part of the gold rush or to get some money to send home by working on the railways and then go back. That was the plan at the beginning. Well, they were hoping to find gold, get rich, and then go, go back home. Yes, <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah, but true story, it's not that. It's it seemed like else. a lot of the tension, like, I know that the like the railway workers were really welcomed, at least in this part of the world. It was great to have all of these laborers. Um, you know, they couldn't speak a lot of English, but they you didn't have to pay them a whole bunch, and they did the work. And but then, like, does the tension arise when it's like, oh, they but they want to stay and they want to bring their families, and um, and they're going to be part of the permanent workforce? Was there there must have been some tension around that. Oh yeah, there's like, well, this is the next section, which is by the 1870s, um, they were actually competing with, um, I guess, European Americans in the job market. So that's why, you know, there's hostility and that's how 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act came into place. Because, I mean, you no know, one wants to compete in the job market and, you know, like, and the Chinese were working at a lower wage. Right. So that's how the hostility became, I guess, the law. So let's go on. So, um, so jobs became scarce and then there was widespread economic depression. And then there was, you know, public fear and hostility against this large number of Chinese laborers. So by 1882, it got so bad that Congress passed the Exclusion Act of uh, 1882, and it suspended immigration of Chinese laborers for 10 years um, under penalty of imprisonment and deportation. It also excluded from, they were also excluded from becoming U.S. citizen. So Chinese immigrants in the U.S. had very little chance of reuniting with their families back in China. Um, but there were exemptions for diplomats, students, and merchants. So one of the most uh, noticeable characteristics of the Chinese population residing in the U.S. before World War II was the shortage of women. And Lee earlier um, mentioned, you know, about prostitutes and all that. So um, women, they had to really get through a scrutiny uh, of screening and everything 
before they could even come to the US. So there were very, very few women who could make it here. Plus the Chinese culture, they kind of limited um, women from traveling, especially when you are married woman, you're supposed to take care of your family that include your in-laws. So that's why it was the young Chinese men who came over here and left their wives and children behind in China. So that, that explained why there were so, many, so little women. And also there were laws against uh, Chinese women coming in because um, they were suspected of you know, practicing prostitution and you know, being immoral and all that. So you had to jump through a ton of hoops to prove that you're the wife of a laborer who's already over stateside. Yeah, and so then, with the exclusion acts, they were absolutely banned from, from coming in. So that's why, you know, it's, it explains why there were so few women. So in 1850, the Chinese community of San Francisco consists of 4,018 men, but only seven women. <laughs> that's the racial, yeah. So Chinese uh, Americans, they never got the right to reunite with their wives until a ruling in 1902, which suggested there was, I think I see a question where the Chinese who were already here in 1882 allowed to return home. Yes, but they would have to like prove when they come back to prove that, you know, they came in legally. So if you don't have the paperwork, then you, you know, they, they wouldn't want to leave because you couldn't come back into the country. Is there another question? I can't see. I think that's it for now. That's it. Uh, Chuck has a question about Pendleton over here in Q and A. And folks, if you can use the use the Q and A as much as you can, I I we've trained ourselves to use the chat, but let's try and use the Q and A feature over here. Um, but yeah, Chuck had a question about Pendleton, so specifically and about the, the community there, but maybe we'll get to that towards the end. Okay, so we've got this major gender gap. Um, San Francisco's got seven ladies. Oof. And, and I, uh, one of the figures I saw was that in 1882, right before they passed the Exclusion Act, so just in the few months before that, like 40,000 Chinese folks entered the US and only 136 of them were women. So just to further underline Wendy's point that there was a huge gender gap and uh, folks could go back to China to be with their families, but there weren't a lot of opportunities to build new families here. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself and disappear for a second. Okay, so um, going back to the ruling in 1902, so Chinese Americans, um, you know, the, the ruling suggested that Chinese Americans, uh, the wives of Chinese Americans who became US citizens could enter the US despite the exclusion policies, but the right was compromised by the quota limit. There were only 105 Chinese immigrant allowed uh, per year to come into the country. So it's, it's still very restrictive even after they repealed the exclusion policies in 1943. So that was, you know, the case still. Um, so the next exclusionary legislation was the Geary Act of 1892. It renewed the Chinese exclusion laws for an additional 10 years and required Chinese immigrants to carry a resident permit to prove their lawful presence. It's sort of like an internal passport. So if they fail to carry the permit at all times, they would be punished by deportation or one year of hard labor. So immigration, the immigration station at Angel Island, um, it operated from 1910 to 1940 um, in the San Francisco Bay. And there were over 225,000 Chinese and Japanese immigrants detained uh, for as long as six months um, during that time, because many of the immigrants, they were quarantined and given invasive medical exam and interrogation because they were suspected of carrying disease. Um, 
and because of the exclusion acts, they had to like uh, screen carefully, make sure that they are, you know, they were legal to come into the country. So, and even back then, I mean, public health misrepresented oftentimes um, the Asians as deceased carriers. And it's just a way to justify anti-immigration policy and just trump up hysteria against um, Asian Americans. So, because I guess they perceive them to be a threat to, um, to white Americans for jobs. And then in 1924, um, an immigration act, also known as the National Origins Act, uh, would go even further. It excluded all classes of Chinese immigrants and prevented immigration from Asia. So these country by country limits specifically designed to keep out quote unquote undesirable ethnic groups and favors immigration from Northern and Western Europe. Um, so in World War II, finally, um, when China and the US were allies, uh, President Roosevelt signed um, the Magnuson Act of 1943. Um, it finally repealed the Chinese Exclusion Acts and allowed Chinese immigration for the first time since 1882. Chinese immigrants became eligible for citizenship and then, but it then it still limited Chinese immigration to only 105 a year. And then two years after that, the War Bride Act and the GI Fiance Act finally allowed Chinese Americans to bring their wives into the country. So 6,000 Chinese women were finally admitted to the US as wives of Chinese American servicemen. So should I pause here and see if there are any Q&A? No Q and A's yet, let's keep going. Okay, so then um, in 1965, the Immigration and Naturalization Act uh, passed and it was the first law that committed the US to accept immigrants of all nationalities on a roughly equal basis. It eliminated the old quota system and gave preference, that gave preference to Western Europeans. So now, far more skilled workers and family members could enter the country from the rest of the world. So it kind of changed the demographic makeup of the country because um, you know, more countries were allowed to send their immigrants here. So in the first five years after the legislation was passed, um, immigration to the US from Asian countries, especially from war-torn Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, more than quadrupled. And then there was a new group of Chinese immigrants also coming to the United States and they mostly came from Hong Kong and Taiwan um, instead of the rural provinces of China. So today Chinese Americans make up the largest Asian population in the US. And I don't know if uh, many of you heard as recently as 2018, um, there were some immigration restrictions imposed on some Chinese graduate students in the interest of national security and intellectual property protection. So the, the new policy reduced their, the duration of their visas from five years to one year if they study aviation, robotics, and advanced manufacturing. Okay, so before I get into the goals of US immigration policy, are there any questions out there? I had a question a little ways back. Well, first I'm curious about this 2018 ruling. Um, I mean, I know that there's been a lot of worries about espionage, but do you have any more insight into those uh, restrictions, those five-year visas that were turned into one-year visas? Yeah, so um, at the time, I heard that there was a lot of um, research uh, facilities that, you know, associated with universities. They were very upset by that because that's how they can get, you know, their... Um, 
research scholars from overseas, especially, you know, some, I think there were a lot of scholars from China, they were already in the midst of doing, you know, an important research project. And then now they were forced to leave, you know, the country and then, you know, what happened, who's going to take over the research. So there was a lot of rumbling from universities and research centers all over the US. I mean, this include like, it's not just, it could be medical research, it could be, you know, technological research. It's just like across the board. I know that just in what I was reading in preparation for tonight, there were a lot of, a lot of stereotypes about Chinese Americans, about Asian Americans generally, but just some of the most ridiculous stereotypes. And, and one of the, uh, one of them was that uh, Chinese folks were deceitful. And that was one of the reasons why when they were just grilling women coming through San Francisco or, or men coming through Angel Island, they just didn't believe them, thought that uh, Chinese folks were deceitful. And I'm wondering if that's kind of carried along to today. I mean, obviously there's, uh, there, there is corporate espionage, right? Like there's plenty of that happening around the world. But I'm wondering if that compounds the issues today and is why Chinese students specifically are being targeted. So anyway, just wondering about that continuing thread of discrimination. There was a question about what prompted the 2018. Um, it's not a ruling, it's more like a restriction on immigration. Um, it's it all started with the trade war with China. <laughs> so I think this is part and parcel of that trade war. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, if I restrict more Chinese researchers from coming in, then um, I can limit, you know, the, the amount, I don't know, it's like the brain drain kind of thing. You know, they don't want them to learn the technology and then go back home and, you know, like replicate what we can do here. So, I mean, the espionage, I would say that I don't think that Chinese are more deceitful than any other nationalities. Um, unfortunately, I think because we're more I guess, accomplished nowadays. I mean, there are many accomplished Chinese Americans um, in government, in science, um, in politics now. So I guess it's an easy target um, like to blame it on, yeah, Chinese Americans. And then it doesn't help that the virus, well, we don't know where it came from, I mean, but uh, purportedly came from China, so. Yeah, I, it just, it, it seems like there's just been this persistent othering of Chinese folks. And when you other someone, it's just so easy to ascribe all of these fe features to them, right? Like they're deceitful, uh, the women are coming for your men <laughs> and going to corrupt society. And anyway, just, um, just a really, we think that we've come so far, but uh, some of these stereotypes have persisted to today and are kind of baked into our cultural consciousness. Um, but I'm disappointed to hear about that, uh, that practice of limiting visas and, and hope that uh, our students aren't the victims of this trade war between countries. Yeah. So um, let me go to now. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to fix my screen. While you're finding your way through the screen, Chuck's got questions about Pendleton. Um, and do, do you have insight on Pendleton's uh, Chinese community? I don't know a whole lot about them, but my guess is that they were driven underground because of um, 
you know, racial discrimination. And I'm not saying that they were not, they were not doing illicit things underground. I'm sure that there were, you know, many illegal activities too, but I, I would think that it's a result of, you know, they cannot, they cannot openly do what they do. So that's why they were driven underground to conduct businesses like, you know, the Pendleton Underground. And let's see. I don't know why people were driven underground, but I did read that in Walla Walla, folks were driven out of farming um, because Chinese Americans weren't allowed to own land. Chinese people and Chinese Americans weren't allowed to own land. They could rent it and were really prosperous truck farmers. Um, so bringing fruits and vegetables to market was thriving economy. But when the Italian American community came, when Italians moved in, being of European descent, they could, they could buy the land here. And so they kind of edged out all of the Chinese folks who had been farming. And so um, really discouraged Chinese farming. They just couldn't buy the land, always, always renters. And so really ed edged them out of that business. Mm -hmm. um, but we had a little bit of an underground here, but I've seen the maps and a lot of our buildings in Walla Walla are above ground, just lovely buildings. All right, turn it over, I'll disappear again. So let me move on to the, um, this is, I'm almost wrapping up, so <laughs> is it getting too long? Okay. Um, so if the goals of U US immigration policy are to reunite with families and reunite families and to attract skilled workers um, to come to this country, I think our government is doing a pretty poor job at it. Because did you know that some families have to wait years to reunite with their family members overseas? For example, a married son and sons and daughters of US citizens from China have to wait seven years to reunite with their parents in the US. Married sons and daughters of US citizens from China have to wait even longer, 13 years, while siblings of US citizens from China have to wait about 15 years. And then even if you have a master's degree and your employer agrees to sponsor you for green card, you have to wait five years to get your green card if you're a Chinese national. And this is all because the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1990 caps visas as 20, at 25,620 for any single country. So, and it also sets numerical caps on certain green card categories. So as a result, countries with the highest family and employer sponsored visas have to wait years before reuniting with their families. This creates terrible backlogs for certain countries like China, India, and the Philippines. So, Finally, I want to tie this all in, and that's um, Liv had a bit to say about the rise in anti-Asian attacks um, this last year during the COVID pandemic. Um, sadly, I'm not surprised by it at all, because as you can tell from the history um, of anti-Asian xenophobia, it's rooted in decades of discriminatory and biased American public health and immigration policies that have targeted and continue to target immigrants from Asia. So um, it is sad, really sad, but it is not surprising at all. Do we have two questions? There are some questions in the Q&A box there. So um, Lorraine asked if the 2018 ruling is still in effect. Or not, we, we discerned it's not a ruling, but is the 2018 uh, rule still? I don't, I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it went away? Okay. Oh, that must have been a Biden administration thing? Yeah. But I don't want to say absolutely no until I do make sure that I'm answering the right thing. Okay. 
but we'll circle that back to that in a second. Robert asked a question. He says he had Chinese friends in high school in the 60s who came through the US through the Dominican Republic. And have you heard of that? Is that a common practice to come in through a different way? Although by the 60s, that would have, we would have, wouldn't have needed to take a roundabout, right? After 64? Um, it, were they born in the Dominican Republic? So it, it all depends on where you were born. So, I mean, there's like backlog for Chinese nationals in China, but if they were born in the Dominican Republic, then they're not Chinese nationals. So there's no backlog for them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. And then another question, how has, I think this is from Julie, how has the Chinese family structure or traditions, how have they been both a blessing and a curse to Chinese Americans? Ooh, that's a big one. We could have a whole conversation about that. Um, it's a blessing because um, we still have closed um very close knit ties with um our families and extended families um it's a curse as far as like if i guess i would have to from the po uh, point of view of my um nephews um because they were born in the united states i guess they would find it a little bit um restrictive as far as like you know, what they can and cannot do because of the traditions and cultures. Um, so if you were born here in the US, um, you know, you're, you're not allowed to like do certain things, you know, like you're not allowed to go out way too late. I mean, but that's my family. I'm not sure about other families. You know, it's like, okay, there's a curfew. You have to come home by a certain time. Um, and, and, you know, things like that. And, you know, you're supposed to like um, keep your um, grandparents close at home. And it's like, the extended family, they all live together. Sometimes there are conflicts because of that. So not everybody can live together um, cordially. And so arguments do develop sometimes. So, um, but I think because of our um, deep, very deep belief in like education, um, I think it's a blessing for myself because that's how we, you know, try to um, achieve the American dream. I think that's all what all immigrants who come to the U.S. you know want to do is to like have their children um, get educated, and even them themselves, they want to get you know um, to a you know better job. Um, so I think that um, most American, I mean, most immigrants. That's, that's their goal is to give their children a better opportunity than they had. So there's a question here. Did the change uh, of Hong Kong to China affect our numbers allowed in? Um, Hong Kong is actually not counted as part of mainland China, which is good <laughs> in terms of like sending immigrants here because we're, we're not terribly backlogged. So um, has, let me just check, did the change. So the Chinese are still very backlogged, but for Hong Kong, there's no change because it's like a special administrative unit. It's not, I mean, in the laws of US immigration, um, it's not considered mainland China. So we're not as backlog as um, Chinese coming into the country. But um, did it affect the numbers coming in? I, 
I don't think so. Not not too much. My story of immigration. My story is hmm, kind of interesting. I came as a student and then, <clears throat> excuse me, I left. My sister stayed and she married a US citizen. And then she sponsored my mother and then my mother sponsored me. And that's how I became a US citizen. It's a roundabout <laughs> kind of long way to get to citizenship. Would you read the question for us? Or I can. Dorothy is curious to learn more about your background and education to become an immigration lawyer. Um, so of course you have to have a law degree. So I did my law degree in California and then I interned at uh, an immigration law firm um, for a couple of years during law school. And then I became an immigration attorney. What got you in interested in immigration law specifically? Why not patent law where everybody just wants to end up, right? <laughs> I'm not so sure. Um, I. I guess it's because I'm an immigrant myself and um, the law firm that I intern at, I mean, they kind of introduced me to this law kind of full of, I don't know how you call it, like barriers and challenges. So that's how I got into it. But then as I practice more um, of immigration law, I found that the barriers and challenges became I don't know, kind of like obstacles. Um, it kind of gave me the feeling that, you know, there's really no change in immigration law at all. It's like every year they talk about it, but then they don't do a, you know, something dramatic about the backlogs or, you know, how to deal with the unauthorized immigrants. We have like millions of unauthorized um, undocumented immigrants here in the country, but they haven't done anything about it. Um, so kind of turned me into like a hopeless situation where I unfortunately wanted to give up, which I did. <laughs> so, um, cause it's, it's a little bit too slow for me. It's not getting my clients anywhere. Like I said, you know, some of the Chinese and um, Indian clients, they had to wait years to get their green card. Um, so it was a little bit like disappointing to me. So that there was, I'm sorry, that there was no immediate result. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, I was just, so we're still working from this quota system, right? Like every country has a certain number of people. What would be a better system than like, would it be like a meritocracy? That sounds like kind of what we had. We had a toxic, made up meritocracy before. So what would be a better system, do you think? Mm. It's not really a quota system, but as it turned out that certain countries, they sent more um, employment-based and family-based cases to the US. So that's why, I mean, I guess those countries, you know, they also have more population, obviously, um, China and India. So obviously they, you know, they have more people who want to come into the country. And it's not like they're not authorized and eligible. It's that, you know, there's just way too many of them. I, I don't really know what is the solution, but I think that there is proposal to clean up the backlog, like especially the years and years of waiting, because it really doesn't make any sense to wait for years. Um, I mean, someone jokingly, jokingly said that, oh yeah, your sibling would be dead, you know, <laughs> by the time they got their green card, if you know, if you have to wait so many years, like 20 years, I think, for the Philippines, the siblings um, of US citizens from the Philippines. So yeah, I mean, 
I, there, I mean, there has to be a, an overhaul of the immigration system. I mean, right now, currently, it's not really working too well. Chuck wants to know that if you were given a magical wand with unlimited political power, what would you change first about immigration law? So you can knock down any of these barriers or cut through any red tape, what would you do? I would like, first of all, I would like to find some way to legalize the undocumented immigrants in the US. I mean, they work in the country, they pay taxes. I don't see you know, how and why we cannot assimilate them. You know, I mean, back in the days, we legalized many Europeans. They didn't have any papers. Yeah. So deal with the folks who are here now and need some kind of documentation and move forward. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I'm curious about um, like the so-called Muslim ban from a few years back, which we're working through now, but um, do you have any insight on, on those kind of country specific? Um, I think that Biden has lifted that ban. Yeah, so what happens now for all the people who like were in the process of immigrating? Do you know if they if their cases just disappeared and they have to start all over again? I If their cases are in the pipeline, they don't have to start all over again. I think there was just a pause, you know, during the previous administration. Did that feel like a throwback at all to the Chinese Exclusion Act? It was kind of like, wow, you just pulled this one out of the old files. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was multiple countries, right? Definitely history repeating itself, yes. Is there any wisdom at all in like, just, I mean, what was the rationale? It was like a terror, was it a terrorism threat? Yeah. In the, in the interest of national security, yes. Right, though immigrants get such a thorough screening that that's, I mean, they're some of the, the best background checked people in the world by the time they get here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I there's mean, like medical on the average American. And there's like, um, yeah, I mean, FBI screening and there's medical exam. I mean, you can't carry any disease into the country. So yes, I mean, there's like all kinds of screening before you could come into this country. I'm wondering if there's ever a situation where it's a good idea to just shut down immigration from, a, from an entire country. Thinking about that exclusion act from the 1880s. Okay, any other questions? Let's see. Oh, okay. Well, we answered we answered why immigration law. You got convinced by your the law firm you were working with and how you would change immigration law. You'd work with the undocumented first, the folks who are here already, and fixing the backlog. Um, all right. Hey Zidane, do you have any questions? Come join us been here the whole time, Lee. Don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, Wendy, I think maybe more connecting to why we're all um, interested in this topic right now. I'm curious about um, what you see as reparations-esque things um, for our Asian American community in the United, or yeah, Asian American community um, moving forward particularly in light of what we saw in Atlanta um, and what we've really been seeing through the pandemic and also, you know, don't want to um, discount the lives that were hurt and lost before the pandemic, but particularly with what we're seeing now, what do you kind of see as things that we can do to remedy or to, um, yeah, reparate, repair that damage that we've done? 
I think that everybody needs to open up their mind and get to know uh, other nationalities. I think the more you know, the more you find that we are similar. Um, in, it's like we all have parents, we all have brothers and sisters. Um, we all try to live a good life. So, I mean, I don't know why certain groups, you know, try to attack another group. Just, I mean, I don't think that there is anything that, you know, that any good that would come out of it. Um, I think maybe having, you know, not maybe, but I mean, there's a national dialogue right now going on, you know, and so it's more out there. Um, we, the more we talk about it, I'm hoping that the more people would start to understand that really it's not, you know, Asian Americans fault that we have this pandemic. We are not even, um, in China, we, there's really no way that we could spread the disease, you know, the, the virus. Um, and really, um, we actually don't know for sure how the virus came about. So well, let's not try to blame one group of people over another. It, maybe it came from somewhere else. We don't know for sure. So yeah. But really, I think that having, you know, a dialogue, um, that's the first uh, thing that we need to do. I mean, it's not a reparation, but it's a start. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Um, it also seems like someone, someone at Pioneer United Methodist, <laughs> I'm assuming Pastor Julie, um, mm -hmm. is wondering how you have found living in Walla Walla for however long you've been here. I've been here like 20 some years now. So, um, I think this community is really welcoming. I mean, I haven't faced um, any racial attacks or discrimination here in this town. So um, I really enjoy living in this small town in Eastern Washington. I think Pastor Julie can um, agree <laughs> to that. Um, so it's a very, um, Definitely generous community and welcoming. Um, maybe I'm just blind to the other aspects of Walla Walla, but I haven't seen any openly racial attacks. Have you, Sedane? I mean, yeah, um, I have not. I know that there have been a lot of um, there's been a couple incidents on our Whitman campus um, with racial attacks, um, mostly verbal from what I understand, but don't quote me on that um, in the last few years. Um, but, you know, I think that there is there are issues of divisiveness in our community with the way housing is set up and jobs and just kind of more um, informal things that I think have, like I said, kind of created divides in our community. But I think that um, 2020 and 2021 have definitely provided dialogues, as you said, to um, recognize those divisive forces. And I think that's the first step in um, remedying those and trying to move forward um, and be better with how we treat our neighbors um, and our loved ones and strangers as well. And I think that's part of it too, is we don't even have to know people to treat them with kindness. So, yeah. Um, Leave. do you have other things you want to say? Before well, I just, I love what you and Wendy said, and Wendy's challenge for us to get to know one another better, because it just, it seems like this whole, the whole history of Chinese American immigration and all of the weird legislation around it, it's just, it all came out of this deep fear, like the, the Chinese workers were a very small population, but impacting a few localities very strongly, right, and then the white workers there were afraid that they were going to lose their jobs, they were going to lose their wages. Um, there was fear that um, Chinese women would um, like bring sexual immorality, that Chinese people would bring um, illness into the community, that somehow um, this, these strangers would change forever the United States and that that would be a terrible thing. 
and I think so much just fear and ignorance. Um, and so getting to know one another and understanding that um, it doesn't take away from the character of the United States to welcome new people in. And Wendy, do you have any good stories from immigration law of just rec like recognizing that these, these new friends, these new neighbors from around the world enrich the American experience instead of taking away from it? I'm sorry, I was reading the, the chat questions. <laughs> Oh, there's, oh, they're coming in from all angles. Okay, so Dorothy had, oh, Dorothy ha, uh, promotes an article. Um, oh, just saying that Walla Wallans were generally friendly to the Chinese. Um, yeah, although we didn't manage to hang on to our Chinese population. Most of them left. And what I heard was really because of land. There was just no chance of settling. Um, but there was some there was some violence up in the Tri Cities um, against railway workers. Um, but here in Walla Walla, it seemed generally pretty friendly. Just these really ex exclusionary laws prevented Chinese families from putting down roots. And so we kind of, we lost, we lost our Chinese population. It was, and especially if that Ackerland article goes to 1962, by the 70s, just the, the, the community was gone. The kind of the hub of Chinese American life in Walla Walla was sold in 1962 to a non-Chinese person who shortly thereafter demolished it. And so the folks who were living there just were scattered. Um, but I mean, I'm happy to hear that Walla Walla is generally an accepting place, especially today. But we have a complicated history everywhere. Wendy, any final thoughts? We've got two minutes left before we let folks scatter. What was your question to me earlier? I'm sorry. Oh, well, I wanted to, I was curious about stories from your immigration work that just kind of underline that immigration is not something to be feared, that it just, it enriches the American melting pot rather than, because so much of the the, act, the legislation that we talked about tonight just came out of fear that somehow a, a, having Chinese Americans would change forever the nature of America and would ruin America. But instead we found Chinese Americans enrich America. And so anyway, I want I was wondering about stories from your immigration work that kind of underline that point. That immigration is great. There's also the compassionate side of our immigration law, which I didn't go into. We also have um, uh, refugees who come into the country based on political asylum. Um, and, you know, it's like we are in general a very welcoming country and we try to help you know, um, people who are suffering from other parts of the world. So yeah, there are um, many stories, like people really appreciate getting citizenship um, in this country, like myself, as soon as I could, uh, I could apply for citizenship, I did. And there was a question about how long did it take me? Um, generally, the rule is five years um, after you get your green card. So as soon as I was able to, I did. <laughs> so yeah. And I was um, very touched by the whole ceremony um, when I became a US citizen. Well, Julie said it best when she put in the question and answer box. We love you. Thank you for all that you do for this community, Wendy. We are blessed by your presence. And thank, thank you. you. And I miss my pioneer family. <laughs> we miss you too. We're so grateful that you came back for this good learning experience. So thank you friends for all of your good questions. And thank you Sadan as always. And Wendy, thank you so much for making time for us. So. Thank you so much for having me. Let's continue this conversation church community and Walla Walla community. Um, let's get to know more about our uh, Asian American history and as Wendy suggested, get to know one another better um, so that there can be more kindness, more compassion, um, more understanding. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We'll see you next time. So Don, do you want us, 
this month we had a little bit of a, a swap so we got to talk about asian american stuff next month we're going to be do you want to tell tell us who we're going to be talking to most definitely yeah for those who are still here we are planning um for may to be our walla walla speaks where we bring in uh chief police chief scott bieber um to talk about the chief advisory council um, and how our Walla Walla Police Department has been um, responding and reforming um, based off of community conversations after the death or the murder of George Floyd in summer of 2020 um, and subsequent police killings, um, most notably, notably um, the one that just happened in Minnesota. Um, so those will all be part of our conversation and we hope you join us so that we can continue to have a dialogue um, and create a better and more compassionate community for us all. And as always, that's the second Tuesday at 630. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Zidane. Thank you, friends. Have a great night. See you next time. Bye.